Graham Mack Breakfast Show. The Pope arrives in the UK this morning. Keith Porteous Wood is Executive Director of the National Secular Society, which is publicising a campaign called Protest the Pope. Good morning. Your organisation is the National Secular Society. How many members have you got? We've got, I think, the views that we are expressing at the moment by the polls that have come out in the last two or three days are the majority views of the country. And there are how many members has the another. National Secular really Society think, you know, got? That, that's the, the point is the message that we're giving. We're a pressure group. And, and that's not it, what I asked you. I asked you how no, many I heard, members. I heard, what, I heard what you asked. Well, then answer the, the question. The point is that it's a much more important this the views on the uh, moral teachings of the church are, not, are only ch- uh, shown uh, shared by a very small proportion of Catholics, 5% on contraception, and the harm that that does to, for I, I'm, poverty I'm, and I'm not sure deaths. why asking that question has made you so angry, but I'm going to ask you again because it's clearly a, an important question. How many members no, do I, the I, National I, I, Secular Society relevant. have? It's not relevant to the message that we're giving. I was just wondering how big your organisation is. We're, we're a whole group of organisations involved more or, in protest the Pope. Is it more or less than 20? That's just a silly point. <laughs> I just don't want to engage with that. So, uh, it, it, I, don't, I just can't understand... And with, I don't with, understand why Catholics you won't answer what Pope should is. be a simple question. You've got an organisation. I heard you had 12 members, is that true? I'm not even going to answer that rather silly question. <laughs> OK, well, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. No. Christine Hamilton. Good morning, Graham. Are you still Mrs. British Battleaxe? I am Mrs. British Battleaxe. I changed my name by legal deed poll. Yes, I did. <laughs> so I am Mrs. British Battleaxe. You're even Brit underscore Battleaxe on your Twitter account. I'm Brit underscore Battleaxe. I know, it's a bit of a joke. Neil dubbed, well, the press dubbed me a Battleaxe way back in 1997. And, you know, hey, you might as well run with it. <laughs> it's a joke, really. Of course it's a joke. But what, it's a good one. Are you near <laughs> anything you can Twitter on right now? Oh, my goodness. Well, I mean, I could. Twitter, yes. Are you near I'm your a phone? woman, I can do two things at okay. once. Okay, you near your phone or computer? Can you just tweet, I'm on with Graham Mack from BBC Wiltshire? I'm on with with Graham Mack, G R A H A M. Oh, I've left an A out. Oh, a- no, a- a- Graham, a- yep. Mack, M A C K. On BBC Wiltshire. <laughs> I'm on with Graham Mack on BBC Wiltshire. That's it. Hello, everyone. <laughs> very much. BBC Wiltshire with Graham Mack. Voting starts today to select the next Labour leader. We've already heard from uh, candidates Andy Burnham, Ed Balls and David Miliband who all visited Swindon in recent weeks. This morning we're joined by Ed Miliband. Good morning, Ed. Good morning, Graham. Nice to be with you. Why can't you and your brother David decide which one of you should go for the leadership? Oh, well, like a deal between Brown and Blair, you mean, in 1994. I'm not sure that did us much good or the country much good in the sense that I think it would have been better if both of them had stood um, and uh, sort of got that out of the way. I offer a distinctive message, which is about the need for Labour to change and move on from new Labour. I think I'm the candidate who recognises the votes we lost at the election from our working class supporters and our middle class supporters and the need to change on some key aspects of policy, like the fact that people are stuck in low paid work, uh, that we made a mistake on tuition fees on Iraq, for example. And I think unless we have the courage to change, which I think I'm the, I'm the person that's shown that, we won't win back power. But you can't even work things out with your own brother. How can you bring unity to the Labour Party? Oh, I think we will have unity if I'm the leader, if anyone is the leader, whoever is the leader, after uh, September the 25th. It's a good, clean contest. It is it is fraternal. I think, actually, the media has been struck by it's been mostly a civilised and friendly contest. But in the end, there's a fundamental disagreement, I think, about the scale of change we need. Tony Blair says we've just got to keep going with new Labour, not move a millimetre away from it. I think that's wrong, frankly. I think there are things that are right about new Labour. Uh, for example, we've got to appeal to all sections of society. But if we think that we, the 1990s formula will work 20 years later, I think we're mistaken. But there'd be no new Labour if the original Labour worked. Well, New Labour was a necessary response to Labour's defeat. But again, once now that we've lost in 2010, we need to move on again. And you always have an older generation who will say, look, we've just got to stick with the way things were. But unless we change, uh, and unless we kind of, if you like, move on from the ghosts of the past, of the 1980s, uh, I don't think we're going to win again. 
You were close to Gordon Brown. Tony Blair's described Gordon Brown as difficult at times, maddening. Is that something you recognise? No, I think it's what happens in a marriage or a relationship that's quite rocky, which is what Tony Blair and Gordon Brown had. And to be honest, I'm much less interested in talking about the past and who said what to whom than I am in talking about the future and how Labour needs to change, to listen to people as to why we lost, to move on from the new Labour establishment in order to win again. And that's what my candidacy is about. But if the book makes Gordon look like a goose, that's going to hurt you, though, isn't it? I don't know what the impact this book will have, to be honest. I think most people will think we honour Tony Blair's contribution, but really we're more interested in the future of, of the Labour Party and what it's got to say about the future than, about, than political memoirs, and uh, I think people are right about that. Lord Mandelson's warned you could take the party up an electoral cul-de-sac. What's he on about? I think that you've got a new Labour establishment that doesn't want me to win, uh, and I think it shows they're rattled. And uh, I think it shows that my campaign, which is about why we need to change the political party and not remain stuck in the past, is having an effect. And it's speaking to people right up and down this country. Andy Burnham, Ed Balls and your brother David Miliband have all been to Swindon during the leadership campaign. Why haven't you? Well, I I've tried to go around as much and many parts of the country as possible. Um, now that um, you've pointed that out, I will try and come to Swindon before the end of this campaign, but it's certainly, if I'm the Labour leader, if, even if I'm not, I will certainly be visiting Swindon, because I think it's a very, very important place to come uh, and, to, and to be seen in. How important is it to win back Swindon? Oh, it's very, very important because uh, the loss of uh, two seats over time in Swindon uh, was something that indicated the way that Labour was losing touch with people and Sw Swindon is a crucial battleground area and it's something I'll be making a priority in the future. Where is Anne Snellgrove now? I think she's running Ed Balls' campaign, isn't she? Does that uh, bother you? Not at all. I think Anne's a great colleague. And, you know, there's no, there's no bitterness in this contest. There's just a difference of view. And I, as, I, as I say, I think I'm the candidate who understands the scale of change that Labour needs. Have you seen today's Daily Mirror? I have. You know what it says, don't you? Yeah, they, they're supporting my brother. But in the end, I think that it's voters who make the decision, not newspapers. And uh, Did that surprise you, though? Because your politics are to the left of your brother's, and the Daily Mirror does lean that way. Wouldn't you have thought they would have supported you? Well, they've got nice things to say about my campaign, but I think David has a long-standing relationship with the Daily Mirror, and they make their choice. But I think what's more important than what a newspaper says is what the voters say. And uh, I think people make up their own minds. And I think people are responding to my campaign uh, and, and the change that I want to bring to Labour. And uh, in the end, that is the choice at this election, whether we have the courage to change as a political party and be honest and recognise our mistakes. Ed Miliband, thanks for talking to me this morning on Sunday's BBC Wiltshire. A hydrogen refuelling station is opening in Swindon today. It's on the Honda site. It's a joint project between Honda, British Oxygen and Forward Swindon. Nick Rolfe is on the innovation team for British Oxygen. Good morning, Nick. Good morning. Who's going to be using this filling station? Well, this filling station here is designed to actually stimulate further development in vehicle manufacture uh, and the use of, of, of hydrogen as a clean sort of transport fuel. And who's going to use it? Well, the station itself is going to be used by principally fleet operators. How many hydrogen cars are there in Swindon? There aren't any hydrogen cars in Swindon um, at present, um, but you know, what we're targeting here is fleet operators, so it's really in, in a sort of B2B context this station has to be seen initially. How many fleet-operated hydrogen cars pass through Swindon every day? Well, as I'm describing, there aren't many fleet-operated cars in Swindon. Our objective here is sort of... Is it not? Benefit. It is, it is none at present. How many hydrogen-powered vehicles are there in the UK? In the UK, we haven't got any sort of hydrogen-powered vehicles that are available to the consumer. Nick Rolfe from British Oxygen, thank you. Oh, one last question. What are going to be the opening hours of this uh, filling station? Well, the opening hours at the moment are going to be driven by actually demand. The new leader of the Labour Party, Ed Miliband, makes his key speech at the party conference in Manchester today. Harriet Harman is the party's deputy leader. She was in charge during the leadership election. She's on the line from Manchester for me now. Good morning, Harriet. Good morning. How can a bloke that opposed his own brother bring unity to Labour? Well, he didn't so much as oppose his brother. Well, he yes, just, he did. No, he, what he did is he put himself forward in a contest and... 
everybody is in perfectly entitled to put their hat in the ring if they've got enough support and that's what he did and really Ed has got a big task now ahead of him to learn the lessons of why we lost the seats that we did in the House of Commons. I mean, it is disappointing. We lost both seats in Swindon. We've got to learn the lessons of that, and that's going to be starting now with Ed's speech. We've lost the two Labour seats. They're now Conservative. We've got a Conservative-controlled council. The Conservative council in Swindon has removed all the speed cameras. What's your view on that? Well, I worry about that, because I think that um, it, it will cost injuries and will cost lives. I mean, all the evidence is that high speed is dangerous for pedestrians, and I think it's a mistake, but so hopefully speeding is they'll wrong. see the error. Well, I thought you were going to get to that. Hopefully they'll see the error of their ways, as have I. In 2003, you were fined £400 and banned for seven days after being caught doing Indeed. 99 Indeed. miles an hour on the M4 in Wiltshire. I have learned my lesson from that, and I am absolutely fixed on the speedometer now, and I very much regretted that, and I accepted I was wrong, apologised, pleaded guilty, um, and uh, I've not speeded since, nor will I. Harry Harmon, have a good conference, and enjoy the new bloke's speech. Thank you. Trying to stop raw sewage from seeping into your home, not the best way to spend your bank holiday weekend. If you live at Castle Door in Freshbrook, that might be what you've been doing. Natalie Slater is a spokesperson for Thames Water. Good morning, Natalie. Good morning. Ten gardens affected, people knee-deep in rancid water, using buckets, desperately trying to stop raw sewage flowing into their houses. 13 hours to get engineers out. This is nowhere near good enough, is it? Something went wrong here, and for that we apologise. Um, basically, we're carrying out a thorough investigation to find out how and why this happened. So you have no idea what went wrong? We're still investigating the full circumstances as to why we took so long to get there. People we spoke to said they kept ringing and you kept kind of, well, they felt as if you were fobbing them off. We're still investigating all the circumstances surrounding this. I follow you on Twitter. And on the 17th of August, you tweeted and you named a mobile phone company... And then you said, this mobile phone company really does have the worst customer service I've ever experienced. Is Thames Water any better? Like I say, you know, we, we do our best to make sure that we, um, we respond to people when they have problems. Are you sorry you sent that tweet about the mobile phone company now? This is something that happened with Thames Water. Um, yeah, no, but let's get back to the tweet that you sent about the mobile phone company about their customer service. Are you sorry you sent it now? I think we should focus on what happened with, with this case. So you're not going to answer that one? Like I said, I think we should focus on Thames Water here and, and the customer service that happened. And once again, we do apologise for the delay. Natalie Slater from Thames Water. BBC Wiltshire. Amanda Broomhall from Penn Hill is in the middle of her sixth surrogate pregnancy. She's just had her 13-week scan. Amanda is here with me this morning. Good morning, Amanda. Morning. 13-week scan. Now, that's the one that's checking for downs. Mm-hmm. That's uh, right. You've not heard anything? No news, good news? No news, good news. They would ring me by last Friday if I was a high risk. So I'm a low risk. If the scan has showed up definite for downs, mm-hmm. what would happen then? i talk to the parents about it. The ultimate decision would be theirs. And if their decision was to terminate, mm-hmm. you would terminate the pregnancy? Yes. At this point, I would, yes. Half of that baby you're carrying is your is you. Is, That's, is, yeah, it is, yes, yes. At this point, I would, without hesitation, follow through the wishes of the parents. This is your sixth yes. surrogate yes. pregnancy. Have you ever terminated one? Yes. And why was that? Because the parents changed their mind. There was no medical problem? No. And how were you with that decision? It was awful, but what could I do? You know, they didn't want the child. Why do you do this? Because I can. I think that it's one thing I can do, so I'll do it. Amanda Broomhall from Penhill, thanks for your time this Thank morning. You. 